I will make a short introduction. Dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome uh, to the documentation seminar. Our speaker today is Matthew Colbrook from the University of Cambridge. Matt uh, received uh, his uh, PhD in mathematics in 2020 uh, from the same university. His supervisor was Anders Hansen. He, Matthew is working uh, on uh, many topics in mathematics, in particular on computational methods for PDs, but he's also very much interested in deep learning, in, uh, in computational methods for linear algebra. And I uh, yeah, want, uh, in particular, to emphasize the fact that uh, Matthew was uh, awarded uh, this year the SIAM Richard C. D. Prima Prize uh, this is a prize given by SIAM to early career researchers uh, uh, for outstanding research in applied mathematics. And uh, this uh, award was given to Matt uh, based on his doctoral dissertation. So uh, thank you very much, Matthew, for accepting our invitation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have 45 minutes for a talk. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for the very uh, kind introduction and also the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to be talking on uh, the barriers of deep learning, approximate sharpness, and Smale's 18th problem. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be able to see how uh, these three things fit together. So this talk is based on uh, two papers, the first with Vagod Anton at the University of Oslo, uh, Anders Hansen, who is my supervisor, at the University of Cambridge, and also uh, the second paper here, um, which you can find on the archive. You can find code for both papers on the relevant GitHub uh, repositories. I'll put these slides on my website at the end of the talk. So if you want any of the links, then feel free to uh, just Google uh, Google me and you'll, you'll easily be able to find them. Okay, so I thought it'd be fun to start off with uh, this graph here. So we're all familiar with the current um, interest in deep learning and AI methods. And rather than going through all the uh, different applications and their successes, I just thought I'd plot the number of uh, archive papers um, per year in machine learning. So this red curve shows uh, exponential growth according to Moore's law. Uh, this blue curve shows the, the actual number of papers. And if you set yourself the ridiculous task of trying to read every single one of them during the first COVID lockdown, you'd need to continually read a paper uh, every four minutes, uh, night and day. Okay, so there's a huge interest uh, in machine learning. Um, I'm gonna particularly look at it in the context of uh, imaging, medical imaging, and various optimization problems that arise uh, through that. So this is a paper that appeared in Nature uh, a few years back where they uh, trained a neural network to do MRI reconstruction end to end. So you'd feed the samples uh, you can think of it like a subsampled uh, Fourier transform or something like that. And then you try and reconstruct the image of a brain um, or another part of the body. And one of the claims made in this paper uh, was that this uh, training method would give you superior uh, immunity to noise and reduced artifacts compared with uh, standard uh, handcrafted reconstruction techniques. So we're going to test this uh, claim later on in the talk through some numerical examples. Um, but uh, I want to draw attention to some uh, bold claims and optimism surrounding uh, machine learning, particularly in uh, medical imaging. So these are three of the big players who won the Turing Award. Uh, so uh, Upon, uh, Bengio, and uh, Hinton. And Hinton in 2017 uh, said that they should stop training uh, radiologists now. Okay, so there's a huge optimism surrounding what AI has to offer uh, in these uh, types of applications, but at the same time, this isn't uh, the end of the story. You also have to be uh, careful because there's also increasing awareness of something called AI-generated hallucinations. Okay, so Facebook and NYU run something called the Fast MRI Challenge, and you can think of this as a MRI version of the famous ImageNet Challenge. So they have a data set that's publicly available. Different teams will go away and try and uh, build reconstruction methods, typically neural networks. And then those uh, reconstruction methods are tested on uh, some unseen uh, test data. Uh, so this is a picture from the paper that um, 
announced the results of the 2020 version of the competition. Uh, these are some of the winning entries. So you can see here in the left column is the ground truth. So some images. Okay, and here is the reconstruction of uh, different uh, neural networks. And you see uh, what they call AI generated hallucinations. Okay, so here you have some sort of vessel uh, in the brain that appears. So I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you what this means biologically, uh, but it looks pretty uh, serious, right? And then you've got another one here. And then in particular down here, you've got this uh, area of the brain looking like it's been uh, cut uh, in two. Okay, so um, you have to be careful when applying these uh, methods in um, things like medical diagnosis, because obviously if you have these sort of AI generated hallucinations, even if they're rare, it's still uh, very dangerous. So two of my co-authors uh, were on a paper uh, that appeared a couple of years ago in uh, PNAS. And what they did was they uh, looked at developing an instability test uh, for um, deep learning in inverse problems. So similar to the uh, adversarial perturbations you get at image classification, what uh, their algorithm does is it searches for a small perturbation of the image so that the uh, neural network or the reconstruction method will have a large uh, perturbation in its output. So let's look at an example of this. Again, this is MRI imaging, which will be the reoccurring example in this paper, uh, sorry, in this talk. Uh, on the left, I'm gonna show the image plus the adversarial perturbation. Okay, so this is the uh, original image. This is the reconstruction of the neural network that comes uh, from this paper uh, down here. So if I add the first perturbation, it's perhaps hard to see the difference if I go backwards and forwards a couple of times on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, you can see these sort of uh, hallucinations start to appear, all these instabilities. Okay, so let's increase the size of the perturbation on the left. And now you're getting something that's uh, even more uh, ridiculous. Okay, so if you showed this picture here on the right to a doctor, they'd obviously know that something uh, had gone wrong. Uh, but it's much more subtle for these types of uh, perturbations here, okay, where um, it's potentially hard to tell whether this thing has actually closed off or whether uh, there's something going wrong with the reconstruction. And just to show you that I'm not cheating, um, here's the reconstruction when you use um, Shearlitz and uh, TGV as the uh, regularizer. Okay, so you, you can get good reconstruction for this particular example using handcrafted uh, methods. Okay, so that, that's AI-generated hallucinations. And I want to draw um, a parallel between the optimism surrounding uh, AI at the moment and also mathematics at the start of the 20th century. So David Hilbert, shown on the right, uh, was one of the greatest mathematicians who ever lived. And at the start of the 20th century, he had a grand vision to secure the foundations uh, for the whole of mathematics. And there are roughly four parts of this vision. Uh, the first was that mathematics should be written down in a precise language and man manipulated according to well-defined uh, rules. And the second was completeness. So that's a proof that uh, all mathematical statements can be proved within the formalism. Uh, consistency, a proof that you can never gain a contradiction. And decidability, which is particularly important for the uh, theorems I'm going to present in this talk. Uh, that's an algorithm for deciding the truth or falsity of any mathematical statement. And um, part of this vision, um, as, as part of this vision, Hilbert um, presented a list of problems uh, to the International uh, Congress of Mathematicians, a very famous list which had a huge influence on mathematics in the 20th century and beyond. And his tenth such problem uh, really reflects this vision here. Uh, to provide an algorithm which, for any given polynomial equation with integer coefficients, decides whether there is an integer, integer valued solution. So, note in particular how Hilbert has fr uh, phrased this uh, problem provide an algorithm. So, he's very optimistic that such an algorithm exists. But of course, Hilbert was no fool. He realized that there weren't proofs of uh, these three things. Uh, and also, there wasn't a proof that such an algorithm uh, exists. Okay, so that's, that's Hilbert. And then along came uh, Kirk Girdle here on the left and Alan Turing, who turned Hilbert's optimism upside down. 
So Gödel showed that there are true statements in mathematics that can't uh, be proven. And Turing showed that there are problems that can't be uh, solved or computed uh, by an algorithm. Now, of course, I'm grossly oversimplifying uh, the work of these two, uh, but this is just to give you a gist of what, of what they did. Okay, so they turned Hilbert's optimism upside down, but rather than stopping mathematics dead in the water, in fact, this led to uh, whole new areas of research, so modern lo logic for Gödel and also uh, computer science for uh, Turing. So discovering the foundations, i.e. what you can and cannot do in a particular uh, subject area, as well as giving you better understanding and allowing you to figure out what you can and cannot do with certain methods, also historically, and will continue to do so in the future, leads to uh, new methods as well. So Hilbert's 10th problem, by the way, uh, no such algorithm exists, and that was proven in 1970. Okay, so why am I talking about Hilbert and this program? Well, I think that a similar program for the foundations of uh, deep learning and uh, AI is uh, currently needed. Um, so I'm going to talk about this in the context of uh, image recovery and optimization problems. Um, but I'm not the first to suggest that uh, such a program is needed. In fact, Steve Smale, uh, wrote a list of problems for the 21st century, inspired by uh, Hilbert's list. And his 18th problem was to, uh, well, was the question, what are the limits of artificial intelligence? And if you think about how early this was written, okay, so 20 years ago, this is really uh, ahead of its time. It's, it's really quite amazing that Steve Smell uh, wrote this down as one of the problems. Okay, so what does a program that tries to do this uh, look like? Well, typically you have two types of uh, results, boundaries of methodologies. So that's method X can or cannot do uh, Y. And then universal or intrinsic boundaries. I'll give you an example of this later on. A result that says no algorithm can solve uh, this particular uh, problem. And there's a key difference, which will uh, come up in the theorem, uh, between existence on the one hand and construction. <laughs> And uh, in, in realizing this goal, we really need to take care uh, of, of two things, stability and accuracy. So we saw, for example, a, a neural network uh, that was uh, accurate for the reconstruction of, of those medical uh, images, uh, but it wasn't stable. Okay, so a goal of this talk is to develop some uh, results in this uh, direction for uh, inverse problems. Okay, so that's... Um, the introduction over. I'm now going to get a bit more specific about what I'm actually going to uh, discuss. Okay, so the problem is as follows. Um, I'm given some measurements y of the form ax. So x is some vector that I want to recover. A is a, an undersampled matrix that has a fewer rows than columns. And then e is some uh, perturbational noise. And from y, I want to recover uh, x. So we're going to talk about uh, fundamental barriers, saying when you can't do this, uh, sufficient conditions and something called fast iterative restarted networks. This is the type of neural network that I'm going to introduce. Uh, some numerical examples, including uh, stability and accuracy. And then we're going to discuss how uh, finites fit into the broader framework of approximate sharpness and a weighted accelerated and restarted uh, primal dual uh, algorithm. Okay, so. The first question I want to ask is, uh, can we train neural networks that solve the following three optimization problems? So rather than considering the inverse problem on the previous slide, I'm going to consider these three standard sparse regularization problems. So the first of these is just uh, minimization of the L1 norm subject to this uh, measurement constraint. Okay, Basis pursuit denoising is, a, na is, is uh, a name commonly given to this uh, particular problem. Uh, lasso as well, and then something called square root lasso, which is where I kill the uh, square term on the data fitting term. Uh, th this one in particular will be important for when I uh, construct neural networks later on. Okay, so for each of these three problems, I'm going to denote the minimizing vectors by uh, xi. And uh, why am I considering these problems rather than the inverse problem? Well, it's just to uh, avoid sort of bizarre and pathological cases that can arise. So these, these three problems are nice convex optimization problems. We understand their solution maps fairly well, and they're used a lot in, in practice. 
And these actually have, uh, in the cases I'm going to consider, simpler uh, solution maps than the inverse problem. So if, you, if I prove a, uh, an impossibility result for these three problems, it's uh, perhaps stronger than for uh, the original inverse problem. Deep learning has also uh, started to be uh, used for solving these problems uh, as well, uh, but I won't really discuss that in much detail. Okay, so before I present the theorem, I should give you the, the setup. So I have uh, a matrix A in my optimization problem. Um, so this is a modality, so you can think of it as something like an MRI scan or something like that. Uh, S is a finite collection of samples, so R samples. And in practice, of course, we can't store uh, this matrix exactly. For example, if it contains irrational entries and things like that, or we might not know it exactly. So what I'm going to assume access to is arbitrary precision approximations of the matrix A and the samples YK. Okay, so my training algorithm can access uh, YKN, which is uh, 2 to the minus N accurate uh, to YK, and then similarly, AN is uh, 2 to the minus N accurate to A. And the training set associated with uh, my algorithm that tries to uh, construct a neural network will just be the collection of all of these uh, YKNs and ANs. So that's a bit abstract. Uh, in a nutshell, all I'm doing is I'm allowing arbitrary precision approximation uh, to the training data. Okay. And then the question is, uh, given such a collection omega of A, so matrices A, and uh, samples S, does there exist a neural network that approximates the solution of my optimization problem, okay, my, uh, my map psi. And uh, if it does exist, can it be trained by an algorithm? And th these are two different questions, okay? So existence, as we'll see, is not enough uh, to guarantee that you can actually train and get a good neural network in practice. Okay, so what could go wrong? So remember, we're trying to um, solve these three optimization problems. Uh, I'm going to actually reduce to the case uh, where they're well conditioned and the solution map is continuous in a certain sense. Um, so the first thing that could go wrong is that there might not exist a neural network that approximates the solution map. Because things are going to be well conditioned, uh, you can use the universal approximation theorem to show that that does not, uh, does not hold. Okay, so there does exist a good neural network that uh, is accurate, is an accurate approximation of the solutions and is also uh, stable. So that's fairly easy to, uh, fairly easy to do. Um, the second thing that can go wrong is that um, there might exist a neural network that approximates the function. However, there might not exist an algorithm that can train uh, the neural network. And the third thing that can go wrong is that um, it might be trainable. So there might exist a neural network and an algorithm that can train it, but it might not be practical. So you need prohibitively many uh, training samples to approximate the solution maps of these three problems. Okay, so here's the first uh, result of the talk. And I'm gonna go through it uh, step by step. Okay, so the theorem is as follows. Pick any of your three optimization problems, PJ. Any uh, capital N at least two. So remember, N is the dimension of the vector that I want to recover. Any m less than n, so remember m is the dimension of the uh, measurements that I have access to. Any uh, positive integer k, at least three. Any positive integer l. Then, okay, with these parameters fixed, there exists a well-conditioned class omega of elements a, s. Okay, so matrices a and samples s, such that the following holds. Uh, before I move on, I just say that condition numbers here uh, there are just um, there, there are standard condition numbers for these types of optimization problems, and they're all uh, bounded by one. Okay, so this isn't some weird uh, class omega that I'm constructing, and in fact, we'll see it um, occur in practice in the numerical examples that follow. Okay, so you have a fixed class omega, so that the following three things hold simultaneously. First of all, there does not exist any algorithm that given your training set, so remember this is arbitrary precision training uh, uh, data, produces a neural network so that the minimum error 
okay, measured in terms of the distance to the set of minimizers, is at most 10 to the minus k. So in other words, you can't get k digits of accuracy uh, on any of your uh, samples. Furthermore, if you allow um, probabilistic algorithms, okay, so things like uh, stochastic gradient descent, randomness, things like that, um, you can't do better, you, you, can't, uh, you can't achieve this with probability greater than a half. So you can't do uh, better than just uh, a coin flipping in this case. Okay, so that's the bad news. There doesn't exist an algorithm that trains your neural network. However, if you're slightly less greedy and only uh, require k minus one digits of accuracy, there does exist an algorithm. So the maximum error is bounded by 10 to the minus k minus one. However, although such an algorithm can train your neural network, uh, it's uh, prohibitively expensive to do so. Okay, so more precisely, if you pick any uh, integer, positive integer m, any probability p within this interval here, there exists a training set, which you can think of as an adversarial training set, so that the probability of uh, failing to get k minus one digits or of needing a training uh, data size larger than m is at least p. So that's an example of um, a training procedure existing, but it not being practical. And then at the same time, if you're less, uh, even less greedy, uh, there does exist an algorithm that only uses L training data that allows you to get K minus two uh, digits uniformly over your samples. Okay, so I'm aware this is a bit of a uh, meaty theorem to take uh, at speed in a talk. So I've sort of summarized it in words here. So there are nice classes omega. So they're well conditioned where stable and accurate neural networks exist. Okay, so you can prove that using the universal approximation theorem. But at the same time, no algorithm, even randomized, can train such a neural network to k digits of accuracy with probability greater than half. Uh, there does exist an algorithm that can train a neural network to k minus one digits, uh, but it needs arbitrarily many training data. Um, there does exist a deterministic algorithm that trains a neural network to k minus two digits uh, that uses only L training samples. And this result is uh, an example of a universal barrier, so it's independent of your neural network uh, architecture. So in other words, existence versus computation uh, is not enough. So it's not enough just to prove things like the universal approximation theorem or uh, versions of that in, in, in the problem that you're looking at. Uh, you also want the existence of uh, methods that can train or optimize to, uh, to get your neural network. OK, so conclusion from this theorem. Theorems on the existence of neural networks may have little to do with the, theory, uh, with the neural networks that are produced in practice. Could you please okay. the connection between capital L and K? Is there a connection? There was a connection, yes? Uh, no, no. So, so these, these are just arbitrary uh, interests. Okay. So there's no ah. connection between these two. No connection. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, what will, will happen in, in practice is that for your specific problem, you can often show that there exists a K. So that's sort of the reverse theorem where you say, okay, I have a class omega, then there exists a K. So we'll see an example of that as well uh, in the talk. Um, so in fact, this is such an example. So this is for... Um, a matrix A, which is just a subsampled discrete cosine transform. Here I've taken a uh, 8,000 8, large uh, collection uh, of um, samples. So, so each of these was six sparse, the solution. And here I'm comparing Lister on the left-hand side. So this is a learned version of iterative uh, shrinkage thresholding uh, with FireNets, which are the neural networks that I'm going to introduce in a couple of slides time. This shows the uh, precision level of the training data. Okay, so you increase the precision, and this is the intrinsic uh, bounds that you cannot beat uh, with uh, with regards to these um, these A's and these samples. Okay, so you see that both of these numbers here are uh, greater than uh, the bound, and then you get the same in each in each row. Uh, so it does it does occur uh, in practice. Okay. Um, so what's really going on in this theorem? Well, one of the main driving mechanisms is the following. Uh, suppose I want to uh, compute or, or, or rather solve the 
uh, following our optimization problem, I want to minimize this objective function f, and I let f star b be, uh, be the minimum of, of, this, uh, of this function. Then um, even if you know, my, my function is nice and convex and things like that, if uh, f of x is um, epsilon sub optimal, this doesn't in general imply that x is close to the set of minimizers. So the question is, can you find good input classes uh, where um, an inequality of this form here, where your epsilon suboptimal and the objective function implies that you're reasonably close uh, to the set of uh, minimizers? And of course, uh, lots of, uh, as I'm sure uh, everyone in the audience is aware, uh, the answer is yes, you can provide uh, examples of this. And we're going to see exa um, some examples occurring in uh, image analysis and then how you, you can use this property here to, uh, to train neural networks. Okay, so uh, the example I'm going to look at is um, motivated from compressed sensing. So I have, uh, so, well, so the model class of vectors that I'm looking at are those whose wavelet coefficients are sparse in levels. Okay, so I have a vector here of the coefficients, and I chop it into different uh, sections. And within each of these sections or levels, I'm going to um, assume that there's a certain sparsity. Okay, so this vector m will just denote the, uh, the levels. S will be the sparsities in each level. And then we say that a vector x is SM sparse if it's support restricted to each of these uh, well, to, e to each of the corresponding levels is uh, a most size SK. So I'm going to use uh, sigma SM to denote the uh, set of SM sparse uh, vectors. And I'm going to um, model uh, distance in terms of the L1 norm of a, ve of, uh, of a vector X. Uh, and then uh, the distance will be the, the minimum L1 norm between X and um, uh, Z in this in this manifold of uh, some sparse vectors. Okay, so that, that's just um, the model class that I'm going to look at. I'm going to need something called the robust uh, null space property. Um, so this just says that uh, the matrix A satisfies the following property. There are constants rho and gamma, so that for any SM support set delta, this inequality here holds. Um, so this is saying that the L2 norm of x restricted to the support set delta is at most some constant here times the L1 norm of x off the support uh, plus gamma times the L2 norm of A of x. So a way to think about this is suppose that x is exactly S and sparse. Then this term here vanishes. And what I'm doing is I'm controlling the size of x by the size of A of x. Okay, so it's something to do with the kernel or the null space of A, hence the uh, the name. Um, so why why do I care about this? Well, uh, first of all, you can show that this occurs in uh, many applications, such as uh, MRI. But also for us, from an optimization point of view, uh, the following holds. So let f be the objective function uh, lambda times the uh, one norm plus the L two norm of a x minus y. Then the robust null space property in levels implies that the uh, L2 distance between Z and X, so Z and X are arbitrary vectors, is bounded by the distance of X to SM sparse vectors plus the measurement uh, noise. Okay, so you, you expect these two things to be small, uh, plus the difference in the objective function, uh, F of Z minus F of X. Uh, so note here, by the way, that I've, I'm looking at the square lasso uh, objective function. So there's no square square term here. So in other words, uh, what I'm doing is I can control the um, the, the gap or, or the distance um, from z to x by uh, the difference in the objective function up to something that uh, is going to be a small approximation term. And the theorem is as follows. Um, we provide an algorithm that does the following. You feed it the SM uh, vectors that describe your sparsity structure, uh, your matrix A um, that satisfies the robust null space property levels with constants rho and gamma, N, which you can think of as the number of uh, layers in the neural network, and positive constants delta, B1, and B2. 
Then the algorithm goes away and spits out a neural network phi n with order n layers and width to n plus m. Remember, n is the dimension of the vector x I'm recovering. m is the dimension of the, uh, the samples that I see. Uh, so that for any x, any y, so that the uh, distance of x to sparse and level uh, vectors plus the measurement noise is of order delta, x is uh, bounded of order b1, y of b2. We have the following stable and exponential convergence guarantee in n, the number of layers. Okay, so phi n of y, which is the output of the neural network when it sees, uh, when, when it's fed uh, y, minus x, the L2 norm of this, is of order delta plus something that decays exponentially in the number of layers. So in other words, um, by assuming this approximate sharpness uh, condition that we had on the previous slide, we're getting exponential convergence down to this, uh, this barrier delta. Uh, and you can actually show in many cases that this delta is related to the 10 to the minus K that I had in the previous theorems. So there's sort of this phase transition. Um, Right, so before talking more, more about that, um, I'm just gonna show you um, an example of this. Oh, uh, I should have said, uh, we, we, we call these uh, neural networks fire nets uh, for fast iterative restarted networks. So you'll see why uh, they're given the name in a second. So here I'm just taking, I'm taking uh, the example of um, fire reconstructions. So A will correspond to the discrete fire transform. Here is the image, okay, zoomed in section here in the bottom. Uh, I'm going to consider Fourier sampling, uh, discrete Fourier transform, and also uh, binary sampling as well. Okay, this is the reconstruction using these neural networks. 15% uh, subsampling, so that means that you only see 15% um, of the rows of the corresponding transform, and um, the the imp the input is corrupted with 2% Gaussian uh, noise. Okay, so the reconstruction is pretty good. Uh, but you can also look at the convergence in terms of the number of layers. So here in red, I have the uh, convergence of the objective function, the square root lasso um, objective function. So you can see you get exponential convergence till you hit this, uh, this barrier uh, due to the, uh, the delta term. Uh, the blue shows the reconstruction of the image. Okay, so this is for Fourier and this is for uh, binary uh, sampling. Okay, so um, what about stability? So I talked about stability at the, talk, uh, at the start of the talk. So let's look at this again. So I'm first going to look at it uh, for automat, which is that um, neural network that appeared in nature. Um, so remember, we had this uh, paper of Anton and co authors um, that developed a, a way of creating adversarial perturbations for these types of neural networks. Uh, this here is the, is the nature paper that the neural network comes from. So here we have the image and then the adversarial perturbations. Here we have the reconstruction and you can see uh, the severe instability. So I'm now gonna run the same test on finite. Um, but importantly, of course, the adversarial perturbations uh, are different because they're computed for the different neural networks, but I've ensured that they're at least as big as those that appear uh, on this slide. Okay, so let's move to finite. So now you can see, even with these adversarial perturbations, everything's uh, nice and stable, as it should be, um, according to the theorem. Uh, and in fact, the uh, perturbation of the output is of the same order of the perturbation of the input. Curiously, you can also use these fire nets to stabilize unstable neural networks. Uh, so let me explain how this works. So um, you can treat the output of another neural network, like Automap, as an initial guess or input to, uh, to finance. And if you do that, you, so you're effectively concatenating those two neural networks, uh, you can run the same instability tests, and this is the result. Okay, so this is the adversarial perturbation for the uh, concatenation. Uh, this is what happens when you don't uh, tag on uh, finance. Okay, so you get something uh, that's uh, not accurate. And then when you add finite, you get this, uh, this stable, stabilizing uh, effect. Okay, so I'm not gonna discuss um, stability and accuracy uh, together because I think this is uh, important. So um, I'm gonna consider the following experiments. 
I have a collection of um, images of ellipses and I'll train my neural networks on, on such a collection and then test on this unseen image here. This red box uh, will be a zoomed in section in the middle uh, column, this blue box uh, on the right column. And I'm gonna show in the middle the uh, results of the uh, adversarial test, that instability test. And then on the right, I'm gonna add an unseen detail in the form of this text. Uh, can you see it? So let's first of all look at a standard uh, UNET. So this is a standard architecture uh, used uh, for these types of problems. And you can see that you get these, uh, these artifacts in the reconstruction. So the neural network is unstable. Um, but it's actually pretty good at reconstructing the text, which uh, is pretty surprising considering that the neural network is trained on just ellipses. So here I'm training the neural network on uh, just the images and, and their reconstruct, uh, the subsampled images and their reconstruction. Um, a trick to get, try and get stability is to also add noise to the, the samples that you see. And this is known as jittering. So if we do that, uh, we obtain the following picture. So we now have stability in the middle column, uh, but we washed out the text. So let me go backwards and forwards a couple of times so you can see the difference. So you can think of this as trading uh, the accuracy we had here for stability here on the left hand side, but now we're not accurate enough to get this, uh, get this text. So let's now look at what happens with finance. Okay, so you have something that's kind of in the middle. So you get pretty good uh, stability bounds. Okay, so there are some artifacts, uh, but it's also accurate. So you can see, you can clearly read this, um, read this text. So an interesting question, which I'll pose at the end is sort of, how do you um, traverse in an optimal manner, this sort of stability versus accuracy uh, trade-off? Um, I mean, it, it's fairly easy to show that you can't have arbitrary accuracy and arbitrary uh, stability. Um, so as finance are somehow somewhere in the middle, but, um, but of course we don't know whether they're, they're optimal uh, with, with regards to a um, given stability. Um, uh, bound. Okay, right. So let me uh, describe a bit how we actually um, build these neural networks. So I'm going to consider a, a slightly broader framework of approximate sharpness. So remember, I'm trying to solve this uh, inverse problem here. So I'm given measurements y equal to a of x plus uh, some perturbation or noise. A is uh, a matrix, an undersample matrix. And a common optimization problem that you might uh, try and solve to reconstruct X is to minimize uh, some um, regularization term subject to this uh, measurement condition. Okay, so here J will be uh, a semi-norm, for example. Um, so it could be the, the L1 norm, something like that, or the nuclear norm if you're dealing with matrices. And then you have this uh, L1 analysis uh, type term as well. And I'm gonna assume that I have uh, an inequality of the following form. Okay, so I can bound the L2 uh, norm um, difference of x hat and x by the objective function difference. Okay, so there's this term here, plus the feasibility gap of x hat, plus some approximation term. Okay, so if we didn't have these last two terms, this would be what's called a sharpness condition, right? So we're controlling uh, the distance between two vectors by the difference of their objective function. Okay, but importantly, we're tagging on these two uh, terms here. And once you, once you do that, once you uh, relax to appro approximate sharpness, it's relatively straightforward to show that a lot of examples that exist uh, in the literature where you, know, you prove uh, reconstruction uh, results saying, okay, if I can solve this minimization problem, I get uh, such and such a bound and how close I am to X, you can take those theorems and you can show that they in fact, satisfy at the well the problem satisfy an inequality of this form. So we already saw this for um, sparse vectors with the robust null space property. You get a similar thing for low rank uh, matrix recovery with the nuclear norm, uh, L1 analysis problems, TV minimization, and uh, various other um, mixed regularization problems. If you're interested, you can look at uh, the paper uh, here that I um, advertise at the start of the talk. Okay, so. Assuming uh, an inequality of this form, 
a simplified version of uh, the reconstruction theorem is as follows. Let delta be uh, greater than zero. Uh, then we provide a neural network phi of depth of order log of one over delta. Okay, so it grows logarithmically in the error term delta. And width n plus m plus q. So q, sorry, I should have said is the uh, number of rows of this matrix B appearing here. So this is just telling you that the width is of the same order of the dimension of your problem. Uh, such that for any x and y, okay, remember x is the thing we're trying to recover, or the vector, sorry, we're trying to recover, y is the measurements that we are given access to, uh, the following holds. If you have this uh, condition here, that the uh, measurement error is bounded by epsilon, and this approximation term here is bounded by delta, then the reconstruction via the neural network uh, has error bounded by delta. Okay, so uh, the way to think about this is if you have an approximate sharpness condition like this, you can build uh, a neural network whose depth only grows uh, logarithmically in the uh, desired accuracy, um, assuming that this approximation term is bounded by delta. Okay, so how, uh, well, well how, 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 do I, how do I prove this theorem? What's the um, mechanism behind it? Um, it's, it's actually relatively simple. So um, I'm gonna use uh, primal dual iterations for the optimization form. So I'm just gonna take a Shamble and Pox um, algorithm. Uh, you can go away and you can take the, the standard error bounds for these types of algorithms. Um, and after playing around a bit, you end up with an equation of this, uh, sorry, an inequality of this form. So I'm gonna let XK denote the ergodic averages of the first uh, k iterates of the um, of the algorithm, so this is a first order method, uh, which starts at, ve at vector x naught. So the difference in the objective function, okay, so this is objective function of x k minus objective function of x plus the feasibility gap, is bounded. Uh, by something here that I'm going to explain in a minute, uh, and then something that decrease, uh, then a term that decreases as one over k. Okay, so this is the um, how 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 close you are to the desired vector x with your starting vector x naught. Uh, tau one and tau two are just the approximate step sizes uh, in in this particular algorithm, and then you have uh, something here which you can control in terms of the um, the constants that appear in that approximate sharpness condition. Okay, so um, you can go back to this assumption here and you can uh, show that um, the error, the L2 error of XK, so remember this is the ergodic average, is bounded by some constant C1 times uh, G of XK, so G is what I call this term on the left-hand side, plus delta, so this is the approximation term. So the idea is now to use this bound here to bound the right hand side when I restart. Okay, so I'm going to restart the algorithm, but the initial starting vector will be xk of the previous uh, iteration. Okay, the, there's a reweighting trick and some optimization with regards to the different parameters that you can perform. And what you end up with is a map um, that uses uh, k iterations, unrolled iterations of this optimization uh, algorithm that does the following. If your starting vector has a G at most alpha naught, then after applying this map, G is of size at most C of a K, so C is a constant, uh, times delta, this small term, plus alpha naught. So now you just restart these iterations every time C over K is at most uh, new for some um, parameter between zero and one. And you can actually show that the optimal parameter is uh, one over E. And then after P restarts, okay, so let X uh, tell the P, to the output, uh, you end up with a bound that looks like this. Okay, so you control G, this sum of the objective function difference plus the feasibility gap um, by delta plus E to the minus P. And then you apply the assumption or the approximate sharpness condition once more, and you end up with uh, the final uh, result. Okay, so in other words, um, what you do is you take this assumption, 
you apply it to the right hand side of this first order uh, of the error bound of this first order method and you unroll the algorithm and then you do a restart and reweight and you end up with uh, this exponential convergence down to delta um it's a bit subtle because if you just naively enroll um, uh, uh, pdhg then you typically will only get slow um, delta plus one over p uh, convergence uh, you can actually show that uh, this process is stable with respect to both the input and the execution of the of the algorithm uh, and if you don't know these constants okay so these two, uh, constants c1 here and c2 then you can approximate them uh, with a grid search and this only occurs a logarithmic uh, cost okay so final example i just wanted to show you that this uh, goes beyond just the uh, uh, one minimization problem that i talked about uh, so here I'm going to take a DFT, a discrete Fourier transform, 15% uh, 15 sub, 15 subsample, and I'm going to corrupt the uh, measurements with 5% Gaussian noise. So this is the test image of a brain. I've got a zoomed in section here. Uh, I'm going to use uh, this algorithm, which I call a weighted accelerated and restarted primal dual, or warped, uh, to try and reconstruct the image using uh, TV in this image here. Uh, total generalized variation here in the middle right, and then also a uh, mixed regularization term down here, where I have um, a shearlet uh, transform with an adaptive weight, and also this TGV uh, term. So I'm not I'm not sort of advocating a, a particular regularizer here. I'm just showing that you can solve lots of different uh, optimization problems with this uh, with this algorithm. Okay, so. Um, you can see the staircasing effect here for the TV that's reduced here, and then th this uh, is, is the best uh, reconstruction, and only required uh, 25 iterations of the algorithm to get, uh, to get a good result. Okay, so concluding remarks. There's a need for foundations in AI and deep learning. So I first showed you uh, well-conditioned optimization problems where mappings from the training data a suitable, stable, and accurate neural networks exist, but no training algorithm, even if you allow uh, randomized processes such as stochastic gradient descent, uh, can approximate them. The existence of a training algorithm actually depends on the accuracy that you desire. Okay, so for all k, at least three, and uh, there exists a well conditioned uh, set of uh, problems where simultaneously you have the following three things happening. So, first of all, um, algorithms may compute neural networks to k minus one digits, but not k. You can achieve uh, k minus one digits, but at the cost of requiring arbitrarily many training data, so it's not practical. Uh, but you can still achieve k minus two digits uh, with only one training data. So under specific conditions, for example, the robust null space property, uh, algorithms can train stable and accurate neural networks. Um, so finance, for example, uh, with such a network, uh, and we actually showed that um, you achieve exponential convergence in the number of layers and that you withstand adversarial attacks. And there was this trade off between stability and accuracy, uh, which I think is uh, an interesting question moving forward. Um, so I showed you warped, which was this uh, unrolled primal dual uh, restart method. And this allows you to provide accelerated recovery of certain optimization problems under an, an approximate sharpness uh, condition. Uh, so I didn't actually say this, but the quantities that control recovery in, in, the, in the theorems, okay, so theorem saying, if I solve this optimization problem, I'm this close to the vector x, uh, those types of theorems also provide the explicit uh, constants C1 and C2 in the approximate sharpness uh, condition. And then I showed you how warped can be unrolled uh, as a neural network, and these were actually uh, the motivating architecture for uh, finance. So uh, an important question moving forward, which is uh, something I'm interested in at the moment, is um, how do you optimally traverse this stability uh, and accuracy uh, trade-off uh, in using um, deep learning techniques? Uh, finance are a particular example that seem to balance these two things, but of course they're not the end of the story. Um, great, that's it, and uh, thank you for thank you for listening. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. So, are there any questions? Yeah, Bruno.
Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So one thing I was a bit curious is what is the computational model that you are considering? So. Ah, great question. You mean for the impossibility theorem? Yes, yes, yes. So when you say, for example, that there is no algorithm, so because you assume that you have access to, say, a rational approximation, I got impression that could be something like Turing computation model. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, the first result here holds uh, for the Turing case, but also uh, something called the BSS model, which is where you assume uh, exact arithmetic on uh, the reals or, or, or complex numbers, for example. So it doesn't have to be a Turing machine. Uh, oh, for the, oh, sorry. Yeah. For these, these second two results, if you, if you make sort of statements about the number of training samples you need and things like that, you do need to look at a, uh, a Turing machine. Yeah. So, but over the BSS model, you can actually, you, you can actually assume, for example, that you can, deal with the real numbers and so right so yeah so, so the this doesn't add the this does not add any in a sense extra power no no exactly yeah okay yeah, that, that, that's very interesting thank you very much thank you henry would you like to ask a question <clears throat> oh, okay okay yes sorry Yes, yeah, so what about, uh, can you compare at all with the classical regularization techniques? For example, your question about stability and accuracy and regularization, one often uses the, the L curve and tries to get the elbow to uh, try to get a point where you can balance the stability and accuracy. Does that fit in at all with this machine learning? Um, so I haven't actually looked at that. Uh... In, in terms of relating it to this problem. Um, so I don't, I don't know is the honest answer. Um, it sounds like something that could be very, uh, very useful for, for this particular example. Um, it's, I don't, um, it might be difficult to put it in a framework like this, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure without sort of uh, reading up on it, but it, it sounds like that could be very much related. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, a lot of the, sorry, yeah, a lot of the equations are at least part of it. Some of the equations are very yeah. similar. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Are there other questions? So I have a question, Matt. So, uh, so I had the impression that, that you applied the primary door algorithm to the, to the recurrence problem, so not to the initial problem. Like, uh, just by putting first the constraint in the objective. To, to, to this problem here? Uh, no, no, not to this one. Yeah, because of the primal dual uh, cap estimate. No, because of the, of the, of the estimate of the, of the one over K range. You present oh, this one. Ah, yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, great question. Uh, no, so, so I haven't, I haven't regularized the problem. Uh, okay. And in fact, that's, that's probably, uh, so the, there, it's not immediately trivial to take the error bounds, for example, in this paper and okay. just apply it to get a result like this. You have to do a bit of fiddling to, to take this constraint and show that you get a feasibility uh -huh. uh, okay. gap here. Yeah. So, so you apply the algorithm to the, to the constraint problem? Like yes. two, okay, two factors in the objective plus exactly. equality constraint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Manuel. Yeah, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. But just a follow-up question to Rado. So this means that in your in your method, you always maintain feasibility. Is it correct? Or uh, no, 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 no. So so um, so although I'm I'm trying to solve this problem exactly. Yes. Um, no, you're not guaranteed that the iterates will will satisfy this constraint here, which is why you have this. Yes. So I was confused positive. about that. So. Uh, so clearly, what's wrong to apply the the error bounds of Schomburg and Pock? Uh, because if you okay, so if, if you want to maintain uh, feasibility at each iteration, you end up with a uh, proximal map that's hard to compute because you've got this okay. uh, non-trivial non yes. matrix A. 
so you, you can just write this out in the um, uh, as, as a saddle point problem. What you end up with is um, a, a simple projection, but, but there's sort of yeah, it, it's um, I don't know whether that, that answers your question, but uh, but you, you, yeah, you, you don't you don't you don't maintain that inequality of each step, which is why this term on the left hand side is positive. Thank you. Manuel, are there other questions? So, uh, okay, Anna, Anna Breger, please. Hi, uh, first, thank you for a nice talk. And I think I just want to give us short comment on the quality measures you have been using for the medical mm -hmm. images. Because um, when I remember correctly, in the beginning you showed for the MRI reconstruction, and um, the numbers you showed were the SSIM, and in the end you showed the PSNR, which is um, just lying right. on the MSE. Yes, here, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, yes, these two measures are um, problematic for medical images, okay. um, because they just give a global measure and they take basically the mean. So for the PSNR, it's just a mean squared error, and you take the mean over the whole picture. So um, you can get really problems in a local manner and you can miss like two more so small um, reconstruction errors in mm -hmm. small, smaller sizes. So yeah, you might want to think about adding image quality measures that mm. measure local areas better for these tasks. Yeah. Great, thank, thank you for the comment. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? So the, the, the property uh, that you presented for, for the matrix A, this is something similar to the yeah, RIP property, I guess, yeah? Or it's really oh, yes, connected. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this, this, this is how you, you typically prove that property. And yeah. it's, it's, it's easier to um, you know, do probabilistic estimates on, on these things. But I would still I, I like to ask, uh, is there a good way to verify it? Oh, uh, so that let's say. Uh, so I don't. I don't think there's any way of um, okay. uh, building a matrix that, in a deterministic fashion, that satisfies this bound, unless it's it's trivial. Mm -hmm. So what what people typically do is they'll look at, uh, you know, um, Fourier matrices or random Gaussian matrices and things like that, mm -hmm. and they'll prove uh, probabilistic uh, okay. bounds. So in yeah. this theorem here, there's something that I didn't discuss which is that we actually develop a sampling strategy which shows with high probability you you satisfy this property so yes mm -hmm. um that's a very deep question um mm -hmm. okay great thank you so then let us stop here if there are no other questions so thank you Matt, for a great talk yeah. and thank for you. a very interesting discussion so I'd just like to announce that we will uh, post uh, the video of the talk on our YouTube channel and on our, on our website. We'll post the slides on our website. Our speaker next week will be Shimrit Stern from uh, Haifa, Technion Haifa. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to wish you a nice afternoon, a great week. Thank you very much. See you next Monday. Thank you. Thank you.